and scenario based training. The title alone took five minutes, so you have five minutes less now. Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry I haven't been here for the last two days. Um, unfortunately, business calls at times, so uh, I'm going to be able to give my presentation. Unfortunately, I have to run back out, so hopefully you guys get some value out of it. Something different to think about is the perspective that I'm coming to uh, when I talk about this, because what, what's important is to think about, you know, how do we maximize retention for the guys that are coming through the companies at this time? For me, I like to start off, we talk so much about the great crew change, and, and I always like to challenge this. My background, um, I spent 10 years in the US Navy before I started in oil and gas. Currently today, there's over 300,000 people on active duty in the US Navy, 300,000. 40,000 new recruits join the military, join the Navy every year. So when we talk about the great crew change and the loss of knowledge and how do we retain that knowledge, for me, the U.S. Navy probably has one of the highest, you know, uh, great crew changes that happens anywhere else in the world. Because again, 40,000 people are coming in, you're probably getting about 20 to 25,000 that go out. So how do we bring in these new guys? How do we establish them to the level that we need to have them at? And then when the guys who are getting ready to get out after their four years or six years or eight years, how do we ensure that that knowledge that they've gained gets passed on to the next generation? So for me, 300,000 people, 40,000 people every year, but there's only one way of doing business. The thing that's interesting is my background, as I mentioned, I was on U.S. submarines. There's 72 submarines currently in active duty in the U.S. Navy. I can go from any 688 submarine, a class of submarine, everybody does business the same way. The interesting thing is I start off short on oil and gas, I can't go from a sister rig within my own company and have the same job done the same way. It's the same OEM. It's the same push a button, something fires, you know, five, 10,000 feet away, but it's a completely different way of doing business. And what we find is as we move through the development of people, we don't have an established way. It's always just kind of been, I'm the senior guy, I'll tell you how to do business, you'll listen to me, and then, you know, hopefully in, in seven days or 14 days, the guy who's my relief does things the same way and we can continue on going about our business. So the military training model, something to think about is everybody starts with zero. I was a 17 year old kid coming out of Western Michigan, went to boot camp, went to submarine school, had no idea what I was gonna be doing. Working from, you know, a kid going from RVs to working on torpedoes and cruise missiles and weapons delivery systems on a nuclear submarine, that, that's a huge transition to go through when you're 17 years old. But the thing to keep in mind though is everybody starts at zero. There is no advantage that somebody gets showing up. There is no skills that somebody has over somebody else. The average person joining the military is 18 to 22. But 99% of us all start off at zero. High turnover rate, as I mentioned, end of obligated service. They always say, you know, happy sailor to bitching sailor because you have four years, you can't quit. So I can complain all day long until my EOS. And as soon as I re-enlist, hey, look, you, you sign back up, you know, do what you gotta do. Baseline training programs. Everybody gets the same training. Something to think about. I know a lot of the training is coming in house. I think it's great that companies are making this investment to bring training in and to be able to develop their own crews. But something that's important to think about is everybody had the exact same training program. So if you're developing your crews on the rigs, it's very important that you establish the way and make sure that way is transferred across everybody that comes through the programs. And training again is 100% job specific. When I went to my torpedo school, everything that they taught me had to do with what I was gonna do when I went to the submarine. When I went to submarine school, everything I was taught had to do with what I was gonna do when I got to the subs. There was no kind of what I would call fluff. It was 16 weeks of eight hours a day of just hardcore training. But when I got to my submarine, I could take with me everything that I learned and actually have a transfer of knowledge that was something I could utilize when I get out to the field. I want to just, hopefully this will come up, I'll just play a quick video. 
Let's see if we can get some audio. Probably best if you don't want to see it, but I'll paraphrase for you. That's from the Macondo hearings. And BP's lawyers asking the Transocean Senior Sub C, did you ever receive training to be able to do your job and maintain the equipment on the blow-up preventer? And his answer was, well, yeah, I went to you know company access training. My company gave me training on it. And then his next question was, well, have you ever been certified or qualified? by the OEM to actually work on this equipment. And unfortunately for this gentleman, his answer was no, because there is no qualification or certification program for doing work on blow-up preventers. Well, that kind of opened Pandora's box because then it's like, well, you're not really qualified to do your job. What's important is if we're not providing the quality training, you know, two weeks ago at the Human Factors Conference, I talked about chaos. And if there's no managed process, you know, the definition of chaos is basically a free-for-all. Well, guys on the rigs, if they don't have a structure, I always like to say self-preservation is what's gonna kick in. I'm gonna do what I have to do to survive, and regardless of whether or not it's right or wrong, I'm gonna do what I have to do to get through my hitch. The reason I bring this up is because if we're not providing the quality training to the guys and giving them the information that they need, all they can do is fall back on the experiences and the skills that they've been you know, exposed to, and that's where that self-preservation comes in. We talked about training. The reason I just put this up here real quick is because the reason we discuss so much about training is because our people are the weakest link. And what I mean by that is we can have the greatest procedures in the world. We can have the greatest training programs. But if the two aren't lining up together, we're not delivering that to the employee, that employee becomes our weakest link. And unfortunately, in incident investigations, a lot of the other downtime events that we see, the people are the first thing that everybody looks at. It's the people, it's the procedure, and have they been trained properly to do their job. When I talk about the failures in development programs, this is failures as a whole. And I'm gonna get into the retention and how do we go about maximizing it. But something to think about is a lot of the training that the guys go through, if you look at the standard training matrix, and I'll use a sub-C guy for example, but you can look at it for any job position in the company, the majority of the training starts at the junior level. And what you see is as this person increases in his, in his performance and moves up in his, in his career, with the exception of well control and some of the other basic you know, courses that they have to take, there is no developmental training that, that follows along with that. So what's important is if we're providing generic basic training and then the guy's going out to perform a very highly technical you know, skill, where is he getting that expertise from? The training that we're providing doesn't transfer to the workplace. A lot of times, and I've been at fault with this when I was working at one of the drilling contractors, you finish the course, please give me an evaluation. They give me an evaluation, hey, that's great. But when you find out with the science of learning and really researching what goes on in the transfer of the, the, the knowledge to the work site, give them an evaluation three, four, six months later and see how much of that training that they actually went through is applicable to the workplace. And what you find is you get a lot of guys that come through courses and are like, this was an awesome course. And then six months later, you go, hey, tell me about that course that you went to. Yeah, I don't remember anything about it. And actually, the majority of what we learned doesn't really apply to me at work. So if we want to maximize retention, building training courses that actually transfer to the workplace is very important. The difference is the scenario-based training, that's that real life. This is the, the, the scenarios that you're going to go through on the simulators. That's very easy. The problem is with the learning and forgetting curves, if we're not constantly going through recurring training, then that, that knowledge is gonna drop off over time. On the job training lacks you know, experienced mentors. We talk about this great crew change. We talk about, you know, I've, I've met with some of the drilling contractors and say, look, we have an approved IADC training program. We have an approved IADC OGT you know, program. We have an approved competency program. But yet we're here talking about how your guys don't have the level of knowledge to execute their job. Well, what's the matter? The problem is, is these guys are going out to the rigs. We've had that great crew change happen, but a lot of these guys are holding back on the information. They don't even know the information they need to do their job, and they're not passing it on to the crews below them. 
What's interesting is you talk to a lot of guys and you get to the senior level and they say, hey, how's your guys below you? Yeah, they're good, they're good. And then you go talk to the guys below and it's like, hey, how's everything with your boss? I don't know, he doesn't ever talk to us, he doesn't teach us nothing. Matter of fact, we're afraid to ask him questions because every time we do, he gets offensive about it. So when we talk about the failures in development, this is also when you get to the rich site. So we're talking about the retention. We're talking about, you know, how do we maximize the learning for the guys offshore? If we're not truly providing a developmental program where it's constantly being monitored, you're gonna lose the, the level of expertise that we have as we move on through the generations. Procedures are not followed or utilized and they're very poor. What's interesting is, you know, I talk about procedural drift and procedural drift is, you know, 100%, 100% of the time. I promise you if you go offshore today and you look at the maintenance crew, uh, and I want to make sure that I make that very clear because after the IBC conference, a lot of people came up and were like, no, all these guys use procedures. The maintenance crews, if you go out and you watch them do their routine work, no procedures. Because they're the chief mechanic, they're the senior subsidiary. I know what has to be done. But what you find out is through the procedural drift, as they move up in competency, the farther away they get away from the written procedure. And what you find out is they might be doing 70% of it correct, it's the 30% that they're missing that comes back to haunt them. What's interesting is when I was with one of the drilling contractors, we went through and rewrote all of our PMs for subsea. Unfortunately, knowing how the system worked, I called the guys on the rig and I said, look guys, I know you don't read these things, but we're changing them. You need to print them out and you need to read their own. The problem is that from a leadership position, the drift happens all the time, and then we start to just accept it. We know the procedures aren't very good. We know the system doesn't work. Let's just get the job done and go back about our business the way we normally do. But if we're gonna improve knowledge retention, there's three things that have to fall together. And currently the way we're at, we're going backwards. And what I mean by that is, we don't have quality training. We don't have quality competency programs. And we don't have quality procedures that support it. Basically, the guys are just backing up and they're slowly but surely falling over the cliff one at a time. And what I mean by that is really get out and understand what the guys know and you start asking them questions and you'll find out that they might know the very high level of what needs to take place. But when you take them to the next level of how do you do the maintenance, how do you do the troubleshooting, what do you do if that scenario-based training, very quickly you find out that they really don't know how to do their jobs. So a very quick reality check. It's important to understand, and again, coming from the corporate side of the business, a lot of this you know, upsets some of my former peers. You can't write a procedure for every possible event that's gonna happen. Because part of maintenance and troubleshooting, just the ebb and flow of business, you have to be able to react kind of on the fly. And that's where the knowledge and understanding of what it is that you need to be doing comes into play. Training in the classroom and on the job needs to meet the requirements of the performance. I like to call it, we need to train people for the six to six. If you really sit down and look at what people are doing, it's important to understand if we're not providing, when that guy steps out on deck, if we're not giving him the training that he needs, we are failing as an industry to develop our guys the way we need to, and, and ladies. And the procedures must be accurate to be effective. If, if you take a procedure, can you follow it step by step? A lot of guys will say, no, I can't, or this doesn't really apply to me. Because what we've done as an industry, and it's just part of what happens, there's mergers. You get a, you know, one company buys another company, then there's a third company involved, and what they do is they just grab all the procedures and they start stacking them on top of each other and say, here's what we have for our well control equipment. But when you read through them and you actually ask the guys, can you follow these step by step? The guys will say, no. And then you look at the safety precautions that don't actually apply to the equipment that you're working on. If you had standard procedures, and when I say standard procedures, procedures that actually work and they're effective to the level that the guys need to understand them, what you'll find is that repetition will always be there. I go back to the military model. If there was one way of doing business, it didn't matter where I went, every one of us did business the exact same way. Some people say, what if you're in the Atlantic fleet? You know, at the IDC conference, the question came up and said, well, if I'm in Angola or if I'm in Alaska, should, should the procedures be different? And I said, no, because at the end of the day, you're still doing the same maintenance task. I put this slide up here for one reason and one reason only. This is what's going on in the guys' minds today when they're on deck. 
There's a thousand things going on that they're trying to figure out. The problem is if we're not giving them the training, we're not giving them the procedures, and we don't have a quality program to actually develop competencies, their minds are going in a thousand different directions. It goes back to that self-preservation. So for me, when we're looking at development and we're looking at the retention of, of knowledge, I like to call it the development life cycle. You have a new employee or a new hire or a promotion, automatically they have new competencies. When I went to, when I went to the Navy submarine school, they said for you to be good at your job, these are the things that you need to be able to do. You need to be able to do damage control, you need to be able to go through the wet train, you need to be able to you know, submerge from so, such a depth. As I moved up in my career, I went from E3 to E4, and they said, hey, guess what, you're in a new position, you got a new training you have to go to. They constantly developed us. Promotion or new hire, new competencies. New competencies equal new training. That new training, you get exposed with on-the-job training. We're at a new level. System sub-C, nice sub-C. System mechanic, you know, basically chief mechanic, you're moving on. From the OJTs, we get practical experiences, and for me, the difference between the two is I have my on-the-job training, and then there's the things that happen above and beyond that, the kind of the outside the norms that I'm gonna be exposed to. Then what happens, I get a certain level of knowledge, and my company says, hey, congratulations, Mike, we're promoting you, and guess what, that development life cycle starts all over again. So if we're looking at an employee development, starting from scratch, first and foremost, you have to identify the skills and competencies that you want this individual to have. I know it's been discussed all the time, it's kind of common sense, but it's very important. If you think about, there's a lot of times that say, I want this guy to have this. But that military model, everybody started with zero. So if we define the skills, the outcome of what they want them to have, then we provide them the training that they need to have to be able to maximize that skill and that competency development. So the two sides of the, kind of what I like to call the pyramid, you have the skills and competencies and we provide them the training. And then when they're out on the field, we actually give them procedures that match the training that they've received, which support the skills and competencies that we said they need to have. The reason this is very important and the reason that we should really be concerned about it is kind of mentioned earlier. You talk about the learning and forgetting curve. And what happens is as you gain new knowledge, you get very good at a skill very quickly. But as soon as you stop using it, I'm the first one as a sub-C guy to say, for me, well control was pump and dump. I showed up every two years, passed the test, I'm done. Two years later, we'll go back and do it all over again. I was a sub-C guy. What is sub-C doing well control? Closing in, you'll sit in the corner, we'll call you when we're ready. <laughs> so for me, when I sat down to take the test, it was like, okay, well, yeah, I passed. Got a 70? Sweet, I'm good. <laughs> See you in two years, you know? It's the only class I ever took that I didn't care that I barely passed. Because I knew in two years I'd come back and I'd do it all over again. But what happens is, and again, I talk about the maintenance guys, especially the sub-C guys and a lot of these other you know, positions on the rigs. If I'm out there and I'm a senior sub-C or I'm in the sub-C department, and that BUP disappears for eight months, how much am I really remembering about what it is I need to do if I haven't seen it for, for eight to 12 months? And unfortunately, if I'm, say, 28 and 28 or 21 and 21, I might miss that rotation that the BUP is even on deck, and it could be a year and a half before I see it. So as much as I have all this knowledge and all this experience, I'm not getting the hands-on portion of it, which is where I think the value of the simulators that a lot of the companies are building comes in very handy. When I was in the Navy before we'd go underway in our submarine, they take us to submarine, the, the dive trainers, who basically go play for, for eight hours like you were driving a submarine. Then when you went off and you actually went on a deployment, you were fresh. It's kind of like getting ready to fly a plane. I haven't flown in forever. I'm going to get in the simulator. I'm going to get some hours in it. Go back. Boom. We're ready to go. This is science of learning stuff. It's proven through research. You gain knowledge very quickly. As soon as you walk out of class, you start forgetting stuff. If you think about the three legs, procedures, they feed the training. As you're developing new procedures or something's changing, you have to make sure that your employees are actually receiving the training to address what's going on in the procedures. And a lot of time that gets missed. Okay, we've made a new change, we brought in a new piece of equipment, there's a new mod. We're expecting these guys to kind of learn on the fly. It's important that you step back and go, why are we providing them the training? 
That being said, the competencies, if it's a new piece of equipment, how do we gain, how do we you know, develop them in these areas that they need to have? And these feed back and forth to each other. The reason I talk about the pyramid is if I pull one of those out, I can give them great procedures and great training, but if he doesn't go out and actually execute, it's useless. It's like taking a doctor and saying, hey, let him give you all this training, here's all the books, you're never gonna put your hands on anybody, but I want you to be a great doctor. <laughs> Same thing the other way around, if I give you training, give you all the hands-on stuff, but I don't give you procedures to follow, then it goes back to that chaos. I'm gonna do what I know what gets me by, and that's the problem that we find a lot of times when you go out and do investigations, it's like, why did this happen this way? The problem was they go off from their experiences. Why didn't you use step 27? I didn't know step 27 existed because we're not getting into the procedures to the level that we need to. The ultimate goal with the learning and forgetting curve, sorry, is to increase the, the memory retention. So I talk about memory as the difference between learning and forgetting. What you remember is what's important. The more we re-expose these people to learning opportunities, it could be just simple drills, it could be you know, getting back down the simulators and going through some stuff. The problem as an industry, we've said, hey look, two years, three years, five years, come back and see us. I forgot two weeks after I leave what's going on. What's interesting is if you really took somebody and said, all right, you've gone through well control school, great, you pass. Bring them back in a month, give them no training, and bang them with the test again and watch what happens. A lot of guys who don't do it all the time will fail. And that's the thing that's the scariest the most to me is when you get guys in the field, we're expecting never to have another Macondo. I say from experience because I had to testify during it, it's not an experience that anybody wants to have to go through because the guys on the other side of the table don't know our jobs. They read about it, they understand the laws of how to go after you about it, but when they're asking you, well, geez, sir, why didn't you follow the procedures? Well, there wasn't one. Well, that's, that's not my fault. Well, it's not my fault either. But they, the expectation is we never want to have this happen again. So the goal is to retain the knowledge as much as possible. So if we think about the, the guys offshore at the end of the day, procedures and training equal repetition. If I provide you with the standard level of training that you need to do your job, and I provide you a procedure where every time you do that task, we do it the same way each and every time, I should be able to leave my rig and the next guy behind me be able to walk right in and do the job the exact same way. The problem is as soon as that senior sub C leaves or that mechanic leaves, it's like, how are we gonna do this task? Ooh, uh, I don't know, can we call the other guy? <laughs> it, it shouldn't be that way, to be honest with you. It should just be, this is the way that we do business. <laughs> So having standardized procedures, again, I go back to the Navy way, 72 submarines, I can go from sub to sub to sub, walk down to the torpedo room, everybody does the exact same task, the exact same way. The difference was the military took away the option of following them or not following them. You will follow them 100%, 100% of the time you'll be punished. I close with this because this is the way the guys are. They can see out in front of them a little bit, but there's a huge fog out there. The problem is that they don't have all the tools that they need. It's great to see companies come along with, you know, the checklists on the iPads and you know, just different tools and kind of, um, you know, we talk about tally books and you know, guys a lot of times will whip out their tally book and go, oh, the answer is this. Well, how do I know that, that Casey really has the right answer? I assume because he's got experience that his answer is right. But if we had the way, then we should have this. It should just be a clear way of doing business. And a lot of times when, when we talk about these things, people go, no, we don't have that problem on our rig. No, our rigs are great. What happens is as soon as that downtime event happens, and you peel it, you're not even peeling the layers back, you just peel that first piece of skin back, then here comes you know, Pandora's box of all the other issues. The guys want to do the right thing. The challenge is as an industry, we need to provide them with the tools to be able to do it. And it starts with training and it starts with procedures. And when you line the two up together, you can take a guy that has no experience at all and make him unbelievable at doing his job. And then you'll have that transfer of knowledge from one guy to the next to the next because all he's got to do is just follow the procedure. He's been to the same training, he utilizes the same procedure, and the rigs will just start working like clockwork. 
and I appreciate your time. Fantastic, Michael. Thank you. Uh, questions for Michael? Yeah, go ahead. Do you have one? Go ahead. When you were in the military, you said you had 17 stops. You were exactly the same. When you maintain the difference, you were exactly the same. How do you consolidate that with the degree of infrastructure, the building infrastructure, the outdoor infrastructure? It's by far not the same. <laughs> no, it, that's a great question. And you know what's interesting is, if, if I use the, the submarine models, we have Mark 48 torpedoes. I could go from whatever submarine had a Mark 48 torpedo and proceed to the same. If I go to a rig that has a GE BOP, camera BOP, NOV BOP, the pushing of the button, the maintenance task, the WAM valves, whatever auger tensioners, that task and that execution should be the same from rig to rig to rig. You could have an entire different package, but as long as that piece of equipment that you're doing the maintenance on, you should have the exact same procedure done the exact same way across your entire fleet. And that's where the big struggle comes, is that you can go to one rig and it does business this way, go to a rig over here, it does business completely different. It's the same piece of equipment. That's the thing that always amazes me, is how do we have two ways of doing business? If it's the best practice, why isn't it the practice? Because it's my best practice, and then it's his best practice, and it's your best practice, it's, it, it's the same piece of equipment. And that's the thing that I think as an industry, we've allowed that to kind of happen. But if you look at it as, you know, it is this, you know, auger tensioner, this rig, this rig, this rig, same piece of equipment, same buttons are pushed, same seals, same everything, so. An important distinction. Other questions for Michael? All right, Michael, go save the world. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.